going to start looking at intelligence and testing. How psychologists qualify and quantify intelligence and how do we create tests that measure a person's aptitude or achievement in various areas. So let's go ahead and get started. Take a moment to consider all of the tests that you've taken in your own educational career. Tests for classes, standardized tests like the ACT or the SAT. You've probably taken quite a few tests over the course of your lifetime. And I want you to think about what their purposes are. What are they trying to accomplish or tell you about yourself, about how you compare to your peers? What is the purpose of taking all of these tests? Assessing intelligence has a very long and interesting history. If we're talking about testing intelligence, psychologists define intelligence testing as a method for assessing an individual's mental aptitude and then comparing them using numerical scores. The idea that intelligence can be measured using an intelligence test was first introduced by a man named Francis Galton. He believed that intelligence could be a numerical score and that these scores would form a normal distribution curve, that you could create an objective test to measure them and that it would lead to correlations of predicting other outcomes. It's also important to note that Francis Galton was one of the individuals that began the eugenics movement and that standardized testing and testing intelligence does have racist origins and that these tests were meant to prove that some groups of individuals were more intelligent than others in our society, even though that is not actually accurate. But from Francis Galton, we move on to a man named Alfred Binet. And Binet and his colleague Theodore Simon wanted to create a more modern intelligence test that would predict children's future success in the Paris school system. And so this became the Binet-Simon scale. The purpose of this test was to actually help identify students who might have difficulty in school. And this test created what was known as a mental age. So the test would tell someone what their mental age was, essentially to determine their placement in the school system. So an eight-year-old child who does as well as the average eight-year-old would have a mental age of eight. But an eight-year-old who is doing better than their peers might have a mental age of, say, 10. This method of assessing students was then brought over to the United States by Lewis Terman, and he adapted the Binet-Simon scale to the Stanford Binet scale, and this was the beginning of the IQ score. An IQ score of 100 is considered average because of the formula used to determine the IQ. What they would do is take that mental age and divide by the chronicle age and multiply it by 100. So that eight-year-old with the average mental age of eight would be one times 100, and 100 would be the average. But if they had a mental age of a 10-year-old, 10 over eight, 1.2, their score would be 120. So that is how they determined the original IQs. Of course, this only works with children, and so today's IQ test uses a different formula to figure out the IQ score, but the meaning of an IQ score remains about the same. So the development of the original IQ test was meant to predict future performance, and we refer to that as an aptitude test. Aptitude tests are meant to predict future performance, and achievement tests are meant to reflect current performance. So say a test you take in class is supposed to reflect what you've learned on that subject, but a test like the LSAT might predict your future success at law school. Today's intelligence tests are usually the Weschler tests created by David Weschler. There is the adult intelligence scale and the intelligence scale for children that are used to determine IQ. You may or may not have ever taken a Weschler intelligence test before. They're often used in clinical settings and to diagnose educational problems. The Weschler test is right now in its third edition and it measures both verbal abilities and focuses on performance skills. And these big tests are referred to as group tests. Not because you take them and answer them together, but group tests are tests that are given to a very large group. The advantage of this is that it's very quick to administer and score, tries to eliminate some of the examiner bias that might exist, 
and it's very easy to establish norms and that standard bell curve. The problem is we're also less likely to detect if someone is having a problem during this test, if they are confused or if they've fallen ill. These large tests often make people nervous and children with disabilities often perform worse on them. So there is the question as to how accurate they actually are. Other options instead of using these group tests include performance tests to try and minimize the use of language. So instead of taking multiple choice tests, try to find ways to demonstrate a person's understanding or culture fear tests. And these try to minimize the skills and values that vary from one culture to another. So if a test question on the SAT referenced hay bale rides, but your culture is not familiar with hay bale rides, that is really not a culture fair question. A few interesting things to note about the IQ test though, is that it does indeed create what's known as a standard bell curve. But we've also seen that scores are increasing as each generation progresses. And this is known as the Flynn effect. That in the past 60 years, the average IQ score has gone up by about 27 points, which leads to the question, are we getting smarter or is the test not as accurate as it used to be? When looking at the extremes of intelligence, we can see that there are both high and low thresholds. When looking at the IQ, again, 100 is average, 70 is the threshold for an intellectual disability, and the high extreme is 130. So two standard deviations either above or below the mean is considered unique in some way. Anything between that is considered to fall within the average. Savant syndrome, if you remember from our memory unit, is any individual with a low IQ, but they also have an exceptional talent in one specific area. And finally, there's the question of the nature versus nurture debate in intelligence, and is intelligence heritable? Again, in behavior genetics, we turn to studies of twins who were separated at birth and looking at their intelligence, it does indicate that there is a strong heritability estimate for intelligence, but it is not the only thing because we see fraternal twins who don't have the same DNA who are raised together also show similarity in intelligence scores and identical twins raised apart have less similarity in intelligence scores, although still very similar, than those identical twins that were raised together. So environment clearly has an influence as well. In fact, J. McVicker Hunt did a tutored human enrichment program in researching children raised in orphanages in countries such as Romania that demonstrated that early neglect from caregivers can lead children to develop a lack of personal control over their environment, and it can lead to impoverished intelligence. What he saw with this tutored human enrichment program, however, was that that one-on-one -on -one attention and intervention for these children actually helped to reverse the effects of that early neglect. So environmental conditions can actually override some of the genetic influence that we see in intelligence. The final thing we need to look at is, of course, bias, because we do see some groups that are both different and alike when it comes to intelligence, and we need to make a sense of them. Because minorities in any country tend to have a lower mean IQ score. For example, New Zealanders of European descent score higher than Maori New Zealanders. And we know it's a really complicated topic. Nutrition, medical care, sensory and intellectual stimulation growing up, interpersonal relationships all have an influence on motivation and all have an impact on intelligence. And it is also important to remember that just because a group scores lower on average does not mean every individual within that group is also going to score lower. That's like saying knowing that women live longer can allow us to predict how long an individual woman will lead. That is not true and this has no bearing on any individual's IQ scores. More than anything, this raises the question of testing bias. And testing bias is when a test yields either higher or lower scores on average when it's administered to a single specific group, such as people of a particular race or sex, than when administered to the average population. It seems to be that test takers' expectations can also play a role on the outcome of their test. A concept known as the stereotype threat tells us that there is a self-fulfilling prophecy that takes place that one will be evaluated based on a negative stereotype, and so then they perform like that stereotype. We see differences in test scores when those that are taking the test are black and the proctor is white. 
Same thing if the proctor is a male and the test taker is a female. So the stereotype threat seems to have an unconscious influence on the outcome of individuals' test scores and is worth considering when looking at the outcome of these different standardized tests. So the major takeaway here when talking about and thinking about intelligence tests is that these intelligence tests really only reflect one aspect of a person's personal competence and how accurately they reflect them may be in question. In our next video, we'll talk a little bit more about how these tests are created and how we can attempt to make them as valid and reliable as possible. So thank you so much for watching and remember, be kind to your mind.